Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve DeMello, Director of Healthcare here at Citrus. I'd like to welcome you to today's research exchange, including the folks who are joining us by webcast this afternoon. A special thanks to Infineon for, as always, providing our lunch for the event. And also a reminder to folks that um, what you have probably brought your plate on, or your lunch on, the plates, et cetera, are all compostable, and we have green bins at the back of the room when you're finished. It's my great pleasure to introduce Heather Young today. Heather is a nurse leader, educator, and scientist, and a nationally recognized expert in gerontological nursing and rural health care. Heather was appointed Associate Vice Chancellor for Nursing at UC Davis Health System in 2008. She also serves as the founding dean of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. Dr. Young holds bachelor's degrees from UC Davis and Southern Oregon State College and master's and doctorate degrees in nursing science from the University of Washington. Her subject today is Advancing Health Through Technology, the vision of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. Please join me in welcoming Heather Young. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. What a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thank you for inviting me. In the next little while, what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the new Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, a little bit of information about how it came about and the history of that and why we're actually embarking on something like this at this time in the history of the UC system. And then share with you some conceptual areas and research areas that we will be emphasizing in our school. And, and part of my agenda in sharing that with you is for you to think about ways that we can collaborate and connect. So as I'm talking about the health agenda and the issues that we will be addressing, I'm really eager to hear your th thoughts and your input as we go forward um, about ways that we can collaborate to advance health through technology. My background is I started out as a clinical nurse working in intensive care units um, in the 80s, and that's a pretty highly technical environment. Probably of all the nursing environments at that time, it led in the technical aspect. There were more beeps and buzzers and monitors and things than just about anywhere else in the hospital. And I was always very interested in working with the technology that I had to understand what was going on with my patients and to improve health. I moved into the community after a while and became a geriatric nurse practitioner working in community-based settings and working with older adults and became more and more interested in how technology could actually enhance health in those settings and actually worked with a postdoc in around 1990 who was very interested in how um, self-monitoring using a computer for older adults in a nursing home could improve their rehab progress. So these were people in their 80s and 90s who'd had hip fractures and who ended up in nursing homes. And um, this postdoc that I was working with was really interested in getting them online. And if you remember 1990 computers, it was no easy feat to do that. <laughs> you had to go through DOS and all of that to get to, the, get to the screens you wanted. But she designed these really creative ways to help people monitor how far they walked and what their strength was doing um, as they moved along. And what I learned from that was how powerful it was for these older adults to actually have data about themselves that they could track over time and see their progress, not just hearing it from an expert, but something that they were managing. The next foray into technology for me was um, as I was, I was actually a chief operating officer of a retirement community company. And we wanted to figure out how to get people active in their food choices and understanding their nutrition. And also, we wanted to plan how much food to prepare in our kitchens. And if you give people lots of choices, you always have to make a lot of food. And then you never know what they're going to eat when they come to the dining room. So we actually developed a point of care process that we collaborated with a, with a restaurant company to do a point of care ordering program for older adults so they could actually go to a computer and say, I'm Mrs. Young and I live in room 210 and I want the halibut on Tuesday. And it popped up and the recipe told them what kind of a nutritional content they'd be getting when they had that choice. And that enabled them to have choice up front and to know the nutritional content of their food and then help the kitchen and the chefs know how many halibuts to cook for that night. So that was um, another lesson to me in how older adults who, again, were in their 80s and 90s, very readily were willing to engage with technology. And this was in about 1995, so still very much ahead of the iPad and other kinds of easier ways for people to engage. We also started to use um, gate maps to look at um, evaluating our activity programs and how well people were developing with their balance. 
um, and being able to see whether they were actually influencing um, their balance as they engaged in certain exercises. Later on, when I was at the Oregon Health and Science University as a faculty member, I worked with Jeffrey Kay and his colleagues at Orchitech, which is the Oregon Center for Aging and Technology, where we were very involved in looking at different kinds of remote monitoring sorts of ideas to help people stay independent, with a real drive to help uh, caregivers, distance caregivers, people who are living across the country and wondering how mom is doing, have the kind of information that they need to know that their parents are safe and engaged in their world. So those are sort of the, the beginning areas that I've been involved with health and technology. Most recently, um, worked had an HRQ grant that looked at medication safety in rural hospitals and how barcoding and, and closed computerized systems could enhance safety of medication administration. So my interest is strong and deep and gone over, uh, has extended over a number of years, so I'm really eager um, to partner with all of you because um, I know about this much about technology and a lot more about healthcare, and in partnering, I think we can do a great deal together. So a little bit of background about the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Uh, we think about this as unique resources and an unprecedented opportunity. Um, in about 2007, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation made a commitment to UC Davis to found a brand new school of nursing there. And it dates back to an experience that Betty Moore, who's the wife of Gordon Moore, who of course invented Intel, founded Intel, and changed the world through his work in technology, Betty Moore was a patient in a hospital about 20 years ago and experienced a medication error that was very serious. It was one that most people would think about doing the negative things about, suing or taking the negative route. And instead of that, she looked at what her husband had been able to accomplish in his world, transforming the world through his technology and his, his genius inventions. Um, and she decided that she would transform healthcare through nursing because she noticed as a patient that nurses are there all the time. Nurses are there and able to observe systems and how systems work. And that if nurses take a leadership role and actually work on the systems and improve systems, that safety for patients like herself could be improved. So with that vision, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation went out and started to talk to different centers, health centers, to think about where to invest. And they selected the University of California, Davis, because of the, a number of different reasons, the um, extent of research that's taking place on that campus in many different arenas, they're very interested in interdisciplinary work and they were very impressed with the interdisciplinary nature of UC Davis. They also noticed that our medical school, which is only about 25 years old, is young enough that there's not a huge amount of baggage and able to change as well. Because if you're gonna change nursing and you're gonna do it in an interdisciplinary way, you have to nestle that in a context that's going to allow for that type of growth as well and that everything around the School of Nursing would also need to change. So the entrepreneurial spirit and the relative youth of the medical center was a big part of it. And then finally, the vision that we have at UC Davis to advance health and through many different avenues. You're probably most familiar with, the, with Tom Nesbitt and his work um, in telehealth, and in, in a variety of ways, UC Davis is committed to, to using technology to improve health. So we received the grant in 2007. I was recruited and started in, in the beginning of 2008, mid-2008, and we were approved to establish our school in March 2009, and immediately the day we got our region's approval, submitted our proposal for the PhD and master's programs, which will be starting this fall. So we'll be welcoming our first students this fall. So this gift was given in 2007, and, and 2007 was a little bit prior to the economy tanking, and a little bit prior to the thoughts around healthcare reform that are going on. So at the time that this gift was given, everybody knew that our population's aging. That was a given. We knew that. We knew that in the next um, 20 years, we're gonna have an explosion of older adults. In this country, starting January next year, the first baby boomer is gonna turn 65. Every eight seconds for the next 30 years, someone in this country turns 65. That is a huge number of people. We're gonna have unprecedented growth in older adults in this nation. And at the same time, we have fewer babies coming along Few, the, the number of children per family has been reducing, so we're going to have a higher per percentage of older people in our society. 
The good news about that is more and more people are living longer. The average life expectancy is well into the 80s now. People are living longer, and actually they're more functional than ever before. At the same time, there are fewer people in the younger generations to care for them, so it's a good thing they're living longer and are more functional, because we're going to have more people in that age group. For the first time in the history of the world, we have more grandparents than grandchildren. And as a nurse, I've held care conferences where I've had three generations present who are over 60. A granddaughter who was 60, with her mother who was 80, and her grandmother who was 96. And they all came to ask me for advice, and they were all over 60, and that's three generations. It's not that uncommon. So that really means that we have to change fundamentally how we deliver our care. Because when you think about your own families, how many older people there are, and come upcoming older people in comparison to the younger people, we simply can't get around enough. Plus, we're moving all over the place. Everyone's much more mobile, so you don't have the old Walton home where everybody lives in the same house and takes care of each other any longer. Plus, people don't want to live that way. Older adults want to be more independent. Consumers are more independent. So there's a drive to have more control over our lives and manage on our own at the same time as necessity drives that. There's some seats in the front if anyone would like to come forward. I know that's really embarrassing, but you're welcome to. <laughs> So there's some important changes in our society. The other thing that's going on is we're becoming much more culturally diverse, and California is leading the nation in this area. And what that means from a healthcare perspective is we have to do a much better job at thinking about what different groups could benefit from, how to tailor our care in ways that are culturally appropriate, and how to gather the information from different groups about what they want, what they prefer, how they want to be engaged. And so that implies different types of communication. So we knew all of that before the school was founded. Then you have to overlay on top of that health care reform. And recently, we've all heard a lot about health care reform, and most of it's been health insurance reform. But underneath that health insurance discussion are some important messages that healthcare is going to move from being in hospitals and being very, very high tech and very, very expensive to emphasizing more chronic disease management, more prevention, more how to keep people out of the hospital, more how to help consumers to manage their own health in a way that's, that's going to be useful to them. It's going to mean that everyone needs more information in different kinds of ways than they've ever needed information before. But as you know, when you Google things, you have no control over the quality of that information. And you, as scientists, have a good way of figuring out whether something's a trustworthy source or not. Many consumers don't have that ability to make that discernment because they just simply don't know how, do you, how you assess that. So those of us in healthcare roles have more of a navigator role to play and more of a coach role to play in helping people interpret that information and use it as much as possible to their benefit. The other thing that's going to be changing is access. First of all, we'll have many more people requiring health care, but we're also going to have a group of patients of the future who I believe are going to want care everywhere. We've, we've, we've started to not think about things in the traditional places anymore. Think about where you take your laptop or your computing. You know, you want to do it in a bookstore, you want to do it in a, in a coffee shop. It's, you don't have to be in a library to study anymore. And so consumers, I think, are getting the same way about their health. They want the information and the monitoring to happen anywhere. And so there's a number of drivers that I think are really important that are going to shape the future. Now, the beauty of it is we're in this point of creating a brand new school. And while it's daunting sometimes to think about starting from nothing, we also have the benefit of not grabbing any of the old baggage and taking that along with us. So we're creating from a base of saying, where are we now and what do we need to do in the future? We held a meeting very early in our process, when I, just about a month after I arrived, where I invited 20 thought leaders from around the country in nursing to come and visit with us for three days. And I said to them, think about it from your perspective, if you're a rural health expert or you're a, you're a, a, a hospital-based person, you're a pediat pediatric nurse, whatever your background, what's the nurse of the future 20 years from today going to be doing? What does that person look like? What does that role look like? And then, after thinking about that, I asked them to say, well, so what do we need to know so that the person of the future can be effective? In other words, what's our research agenda? What do we need to study so that we generate the knowledge for that person? And the third question is, what do we need to educate nurses to do then? How do we educate our nurses so that they can get to that? 
And we got some very interesting answers from that. And really, in many respects, echoed the kinds of ideas that have come out since then around healthcare reform. That nurses will have an increasing role in being a connector in the system, a coordinator of care, not just with other professionals, but also with people and their families. That nurses will be in a position to connect information, help consumers gather and evaluate both health information that's informative to them, but also monitoring information about themselves and interpreting that, and then coaching them to change behaviors or approaches to be able to improve their health based on that information. And of course, we'll always have high-tech, hospital-based kinds of things, but they're going to change dramatically. When I first started as a nurse, and I always feel really old when I say this, but we used to have cataract surgeries, and when I was a student, People would come in for five days for a cataract surgery. We'd have them there for a day before, and we'd put all these drops in their eyes, and then we'd watch them for four days afterwards, and then finally they'd go home. Well, now it's about a one-and-a-half-hour visit to an office. And that's happening with everything, with laser technology, with different kinds of robotic surgeries. Things are happening much shorter and quicker. So we'll always have that acute need, but what it looks like is going to evolve. So out of those kinds of ideas, we've started to design our program, and our vision is to advance health and ignite leadership through innovative education, transformative research, and bold system change. And what I want to highlight in, the, in this conversation about these issues is, first of all, our education has to be different than it has been before. No one likes to be lectured at. I'm sure you'd rather be talking than being, been sitting listening passively, and we want, need to go towards that much more in our, in our work and engagement with students. We also need to think about reaching students in different places and, and doing outreach and having distance opportunities. Many of the people we're targeting live in rural communities, and they may be a, an important practitioner in their community and can't leave to come to school and take up residence like an 18-year-old undergraduate can do. Transformative research, um, you've, I'm sure you've all heard, that's an average of about 17 years from when something's discovered in health and it actually gets implemented in the healthcare system to improve practice. 17 years is ridiculous. That is completely unacceptable. So what can we do to accelerate that adoption? And some of it is, I think, the system level work that we need to do, not just about knowing what it is that's the best thing to do, but how do you embed it in a system and change the system, change the culture, and create sustainable processes and policies so that, that those practices that we know are good actually get replicated reliably and get paid for. And there's a science behind that. There's an implementation science behind that that we need to develop in advance. And then system change so that our systems can be much more responsive to changing conditions much more quick to pick up on errors or problems and adjust and correct those errors, rather than responding in such a very slow way when the world is moving so very quickly. A real hallmark of this is interdisciplinary education. And the typical nursing school has often been an isolated silo where the nurses learn from nurses and they spend their time talking to other nurses and they go out and do nursing care in a little silo in the clinical areas as well. And that has to change to a different kind of a model of if we're going to want to deliver team-based care to patients and their families, which includes experts from a variety of fields, people need to be educated in that way as well. So having our program designed up front with faculty from very varied fields and having other students enrolled in our program as well is an important element of that. So we're going to be starting our graduate programs this fall, and we've created a graduate group at UC Davis. Most of the PhDs at UC Davis are conferred by graduate groups, and I know that's a model at Berkeley as well. And what that means is a group of interdisciplinary faculty have come together, and our graduate group is called Nursing Science and Healthcare Leadership. For the PhD, you don't have to be a nurse to be enrolled in our program. You have to have an interest in nursing science and healthcare leadership. In our first um, co cohort of applicants, we've had people who've come out of a variety of, of areas, information technology, public health, pharmacy, um, and they're interested in the types of science that we're going to be doing, and they're welcome in our, in our PhD program. 
The Master of Science degree is more focused towards preparing leaders in nursing, people who can lead programs and systems, and also to be community college faculty. So the emphasis in the master's program is for nurses, clinicians first, who then come back for graduate study. But the PhD is an academic degree, just as any other PhD would be. And then we'll be starting an undergraduate program in a few years from now. We're going to get our graduate program started first and established. Part of that is because we wanted to make sure that we really had our research base well established and confirmed before we moved to the undergraduate degree. So we have two main areas of focus for our program, and these came out of the discussions we had with our experts. We also went to the community, to stakeholders in the community, consumers, employers, community agencies, a variety of different colleagues to get from them what they thought was important for nursing for the future. And two main themes came up. One is about healthy systems, and the other is about healthy people. And healthy systems refers to creating and fostering the types of systems that enable care to be delivered in ways that are, that are safe, high quality, efficient, effective, and, and sustainable. For that, the content areas in healthy systems relate to leadership, health policy, which is a very exciting time to be involved in that at this point, system change and how to go about that, and informatics, how to add innovative technology to that as well. And healthy people, we've decided to prioritize groups that have not been that well served by the healthcare system historically, and groups that we believe if we can innovate and figure out ways to deliver health, good health care to these groups, it'll be a lot easier to replicate in other groups. So we prioritize, we would start with older adults, people in rural communities, and diverse communities. So there are five core elements in our program that will be threaded throughout the entire curriculum, both for the PhD and the master's. Leadership development, as I mentioned, um, getting everybody ready to be leaders and to take that responsibility. The interdisciplinary aspect of the education, transformative research, cultural inclusiveness, and the use of innovative technology, both in care delivery and in education. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the research themes. We're in the process of recruiting our faculty. I'm pleased to say that I actually have three faculty now um, in, who've come in from nursing, and in addition to that, 28 faculty who are part of the graduate group um, who come from a variety of fields. We've got people out of healthcare, public health, medicine, informatics, um, co uh, computer science, uh, what else, cultural studies, law, variety of different fields who are all part of that, so it's a very exciting faculty. Some areas that we will be advancing our, our research and that our faculty are, are going to be forwarding as they arrive are looking at health promotion, um, particularly at the community level, and helping to understand what groups of people need to do to improve their health. A good example of that is a partnership we have with the Nutrition Science Department at Davis where we're looking at um, improving school health and working with school-aged children and organizing the parents and the teachers to help with creating gardens and then also changing the, the food offerings within the cafeteria and improving the fitness levels of school children in rural communities. So that's an example of that type of a project. Looking at populations at risk, there's a tremendous amount of need, I believe, in particularly when you add together rural and older adults. And when you look north of, of Sacramento, there are about 70 counties and the, most, the highest group of people in those, in those communities are older adults living very, in very uh, isolated types of communities, very little access to health care. And then going down the Central Valley, that's the same kind of a situation. So outreach to help the families mobilize and provide care more effectively and connect them to resources at hubs where, where that can help them to promote their health. Behavioral health is a huge issue. When you look at the main conditions in our society that are costing the most money, that also undermine quality of health the most, it's heart disease, diabetes, chronic, living chronically with cancer, those kinds of things. It really, it's not so much about the big diagnosis and about the medicine you're taking. It's about how does your lifestyle have to change? How do you manage your diet? How do you deal with the fatigue or the kinds of symptoms or pain that you're dealing with? And that's, the, that's where a lot of the work has to happen to improve, improve quality of life and health outcomes. Looking at community-based care models where it's not so much of a hospital and a clinic, but what can we do in communities to tie people together as resources? 
much more partnering with consumers and looking at ways that consumers can have a voice in their care and shaping and designing the types of care that they want to have in the future. Our health systems obviously require tremendous improvement, both in terms of our, the quality of care, but also to, to actualize what we can offer in those settings um, using the high, the high technology that we have available. Um, informatics, in, in the healthcare industry, what the electronic health record has provided is, is really an incredible resource to be able to actually track people's um, conditions and the, and the effectiveness of care over time. And this is such an untapped resource to date because at this point, with the connections that we're creating with the health record we have at Davis, we can connect it to other major health systems across the country as well as to ambulatory care settings. I can actually look at cohorts that you can create virtually to look at groups of, diabetes, of diabetics who have certain conditions and you can actually do comparative effectiveness research to compare different types of approaches and see what works and what doesn't because you can get a large enough sample to do that kind of analysis. So there's a tremendous opportunity with, with the electronic health record to be able to mine that kind of data and end up with um, having a much better understanding of what works. The old approach of using randomized clinical trials where you try something in a small way and then you know that under those exact conditions it works, but you're not sure if it's going to work with a different condition. It's be, that whole concept is being replaced with a lot more comparative effectiveness research that allows you to take the natural laboratory of life with all the things that are the, the variations from site to site, take that into account in the analysis and then determine what's effective or not. And then finally, health policy. Looking at how policy can influence and how research can influence policy. I was involved with some work in, in Washington State looking at community-based long-term care policy where consumers were wanting to live out of nursing homes and out of, of organized settings and more in the home receiving care and there were some issues and concerns about their safety and about hiring and allowing unlicensed people to help them with their care. And I was able to do an evaluation of that policy that ended up letting the state adopt some, some future policies to allow that type of consumer-directed, consumer-based approach. And through the research that demonstrated that that was a safe approach and people were actually very satisfied with it, and it cost less, that, that led to some changes in policy. So that kind of a, a back and forth is really an important element of the work we'll be doing. I just want to mention a study that we just got funded. It's one of the first studies that the School of Nursing has been able to get, and it's an administrative supplement to our Clinical Translational Science Center. And it's a, a telehealth project where we're looking at improving health and diabetes. And this is, even though I just did the randomized controlled trial approach, this is what we're doing here. Um, and the randomized controlled trial is to take six, six sites in rural communities and recruit patients who have diabetes and then work with them, um, randomizing them to usual care or doing a nurse coaching approach where they're either through Skype or by telephone, depending on what they have in their home. We'll be meeting with them six times over the course of three months and helping them work on an issue that they identify that's most important to them related to their diabetic health. So it might be that they're trying to figure out how to manage their insulin. It could be that they're trying to figure out how to increase their activity levels. It could be they're trying to problem solve around their diet. Whatever the issue is that they are identifying as important, the nurse coach will help them to develop plans and little experiments that they can do to improve their um, accuracy and ability to execute their plan. So as I look at the different types of opportunities for us to collaborate, and I'm very eager to hear from all of you as well, I think that there are a number of places that I would like to propose that we start. One is thinking about new models of healthcare delivery, um, with this idea that health is going to be everywhere, healthcare is everywhere, um, trying to figure out how we can create um, ways for people to access information about their own health, whether it's in their home or in kiosks or at schools, places where people naturally go and where we as providers could reach out and provide better service and care to people. Thinking about care across time rather than by episode of a problem. So oftentimes, and right now in the current healthcare system, care is organized around a crisis. Someone falls and fractures their hip, and that's what everyone pays attention to. And the whole focus is let's get them out of the hospital and back home again. 
And what's often not looked at is, wow, they were living by themselves, they weren't eating properly, so they were a little bit dizzy, and then they took a pill and they fell and they tripped over a rug in their house. And there are actually a whole bunch of issues that could be addressed that would prevent them from falling in the first place. But the way the system's set up now, what happens is that person goes home until you see them again with another crisis. So thinking about care differently for complex situations where a little bit of proactive work, a little bit of problem solving, environmental assessment could do a whole great deal to improve the outcomes. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about with care everywhere. Then thinking about team-based care, how can we have the right information available to the team at the right moment so they can make the right kinds of decisions and recommendations? So I'll take a diabetes for an example because I think it's a good one that involves people around physical activity, dietitians, physicians, nurses, um, a variety of different practitioners could have, an, have a say and, and a voice pharmacy in the care for a person, but technology can help us to figure out what needs to get done first. What are the threads of that? How do we coordinate that? How do we track in a way that's comprehensive for people to see how things are really going and what's happening? So whether it's remote sensors in the home that's checking and feeding back the blood sugars that the person's testing, or whether it's motion detectors that's, that's telling us that they actually sat in that chair by their TV for eight hours yesterday and didn't move except to go to the fridge and come back. Be really nice to know those kinds of things about sedentary behavior or act activity levels. And then these interventions to actually improve healthy behaviors and monitor and manage um, chronic illness. Some of this remote monitoring, I think, is really powerful. And it's interesting, there's been some work done across the country with older adults. And, and the initial concern was, well, what about, how would you feel about Big Brother looking in on you, you know, if you, when you're going to get out of bed? And, and how invasive and intrusive is that? But when these older adults are asked about would you rather be independent and have some monitoring going on or would you rather not have the monitoring and risk a problem, more often than not they say I'd rather have some, I want to have a say in when I'm monitored but I'd like to have that possibility. So being able to know that, you know, sort of some parameters for people, say you live in your home and if you haven't got up by 11 o'clock your daughter gets called that you're not up yet. Now, so it gives you a good number of hours to get up. It doesn't mean that at 8 o'clock you have to be out of bed every day, but a parameter that makes sense that someone would check in with you. Or if you haven't opened your fridge or set your tea kettle on, which is your normal routine, so that the normal routine is kind of memorized and you get notified if the routine is disrupted somehow, that could be very useful both for the person for an immediate cue and also for a caregiver who may be at a distance to be able to look in and, and watch what's going on. Um, there's been some interesting work up in Oregon um, looking at gait in the, in the hallway as a predictor of some kind of a change in their condition. So Misha Pavel is a, a scientist at Oregon Health Sciences that I was working with, and he was trying to detect um, just routinely walking up and down the, the hallway in an assisted living setting if somebody's gait was changing or slowing, how predictive that was of something, something else was happening they needed an assessment. So those kinds of things, I think, have a great deal of promise to be able to, in unobtrusive ways, monitor how people are doing. Um, Holly Jamison was looking at people playing solitaire and looking at the speed at which they changed, the, changed their moves on solitaire as predictive of changes in cognitive ability. So that there's back ways to sort of track um, indicators of sort of that pre- preclinical dysfunction. So if we could detect things before it becomes a problem, that would be really incredible. And then telehealth for care and education, just thinking about ways to broadcast out and get information in to improve the exchange. Um, so these are all areas that I'm really interested in hearing from you about, and I would welcome other thoughts that you have as you've heard me speak. So I'll draw my comments to a close and invite you to, to talk to me. We have questions. Will this hopefully be a model for other states? I certainly hope so. We're hoping to be a national and global model, but that may be really ambitious. 
but you know, I think that I think there is this intersection is a really important one. And you know, as you look at health um, for the future, the solutions are going to be much more complex than the past, and it's going to require a lot more um, thought and perspective from very different um, fields to be able to answer the issues that are pressing. Other questions. I'm also interested to hear if there are things that, that have sparked in your mind as I've talked about ways that you think about health that you would like to have us consider. Yes. So this is very exciting. I, I was wondering, um, you must have a lot of discussions about how to change reimbursement models to fit with this sort of long care chronic monitoring, which is very valuable but not well reimbursed right now. That's right, and that's, you know, I think that's one of the areas with healthcare reform that's going to get a great deal of, of thought and, and creativity. Um, within the, the new bill, there are some provisions within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for demonstration projects and zones of innovation. And I think that's an area where um, we at UC Davis and UC overall have a huge potential to do some demonstration work around being able to pilot some of these approaches where, where we link across professions and we link across settings um, and, and test those ideas. I think that is a really important area for us. And when you look at the entire UC system and all the, the, the people we're serving across our health systems, there's a large population. If we can make a dent in doing something differently there, it would just be an incredible contribution to the country. And coupled with citrus and the work that's being done here, it's, it's a natural to be able to look at those kinds of opportunities. Um, <clears throat> um, very nice talk, thank you. Um, there are a lot of technologies we have to offer. Here is uh, pro <clears throat> Professor Kenny and myself and various other people, you know, we have technologies and we have tested them on five people, you know, students. We need for you to identify people with whom we can work with, who will serve as a translators and conduce, conducers uh -huh. between the population and technologies. Uh -huh. My biggest problem is to find such people. Well, I am looking forward to partnering with you on that because I think that, that that's absolutely the greatest situation of win-win that you can imagine. You've got the ideas and the technologies. We've got the people and the need. Putting them together is really... We have, we have more than ideas. We yes. have real technologies. Tested. Okay. But we cannot get funding unless we show some concrete data. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to get data beyond going through our students, we need for you to identify people who really can work with us and run these test beds, these mm -hmm. experiments, in order for us to advance. To, I mean, we, we have technologies, but we sometimes don't know even what's missing mm -hmm. unless we test it. Right. Could you give me a couple of examples of things that you'd most urgently like to test? Uh, well, I, <laughs> there are several things. We, we have uh, wireless technology and body sensors that we can monitor people through so cell phones and transmit them. We have teleimmersive technologies which we can use for education and, and care and, and feedback systems. And I will pass the microphone to Professor Kenny. He has several other technologies. John, you want to say something? Um, yeah, we, uh, we're also very interested in the um, sort of chronic monitoring, um, home monitoring, um, and uh, as Rudy, Regina said, we have um, general vital signs monitoring. We're doing some mental health monitoring uh, from voice. Um, yeah, I think perhaps to uh, uh, c clarify the issue that we're running into sometimes is that there is a bit of a gap between um, National Science Foundation funding or even DOD funding for, um, I guess, t t technical exploration, um, which 
may involve a small experiment to show that the device works. And then um, NIH funding, which tends to be more oriented towards uh, treatment rather than diagnosis and mm -hmm. more towards sort of clinical, uh, um, clinical tech, uh, instruments rather than uh, ambulatory or uh, out of hospital setting. So, so there is a sort of a bit of a hole in funding. It's not a complete vacuum, but it's certainly a, it's a difficult transition to make sometimes from those prototypes to, um, let's say, a, a clinical trial with a mm -hmm. clinical population. So, yeah, that is something that, that seems to be sort of a consequence of Steve's question about the, the this re related to reimbursement, but the general picture of healthcare mm -hmm. in the U.S. Yeah. I think a big driver, too, in the future is going to be the consumer's requesting and demanding things, whether or not they're reimbursed by the traditional healthcare system. And it's almost like there's two tracks there of, you want to have them talking to each other. But I'm becoming more and more convinced and just watching, you know, the, the role AARP has had, for example, in healthcare reform and shaping the rhetoric, um, that I think with baby boomers getting to that age, the voice is really different from consumers. And that you know we have to we have to deal with the traditional reimbursement and, and work that as hard as possible. But at the same time, there's something about having consumers ask for something, so creating some demand around certain aspects that are probably are technologically based is going to also be an avenue for us to be fostering. Yes. Uh, I have a question that, that comes at it from the other direction, hopefully from your direction. And that is, as a, uh, a nursing educator, lots of experience, where do you see the barriers to providing health care that you believe the kind of technology that we work on could really provide a breakthrough? Well, I think in a couple of ways. There's, um, I think information is not used to the way, in the ways that it could be used and, and in an accessible way. And whether it's information, um, you know, data that's collected typically in a health record format or information about what people are doing in their natural habitat. And I'm a big believer in the natural habitat um, data collection. I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, the, the thing about medication management that's typical is people will say, oh, well, we'll do a Mediset with an alarm on it so we know if someone took their pill or not. I did an observation of medications um, with a group of older people in their 80s, went to their home and said, show me, walk me through your day of how you take your pills. And these were taking an average of 10 pills a day routinely, different pills, plus four in, um, as needed pills. And what these people would do is say, let's go on a tour. They'd walk in the kitchen and they'd say, well, in the morning when I get my orange juice, I'd take this pill. And then a little while later, I go and I, when I'm sitting on the toilet after my breakfast, I open the drawer and here's my second pill. And then if I'm watching Oprah, I know when Oprah comes on, I'm supposed to take that other pill. And then at night when I'm lying in bed, if I'm feeling a little bit of indigestion, I open my bedside table and I take a pill. So they're navigating their pill taking with environmental cues. It's not just beep, 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 take your pill. They're using cues about their routine and the physical space to tell them where they take their pills. And I think that's healthy because those cues are keeping them functional and thinking about what they need to do and why. Whereas if everything's taken away and it becomes just a beep, 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 you don't know if you're taking a stool softener or a heart pill. It doesn't matter. I mean, it becomes irrelevant. But I think it's relevant. And I think for the consumer to be healthy as possible, they need to know what they're taking, why and when. But none of the de devices have a geographic location attached to it. And it was 100% of my group, I went into 30 homes and asked them to show me, 100% of them used geographic cues and timing cues that were not your typical thing. So, you know, that's the kind of information we don't have. So the question would be, what if somebody does it that morning, someone gives them their breakfast instead of them preparing it, does that mean they don't take that pill they usually take when they open their orange juice? So how do you have the belts and suspenders to make sure that absence of routine they still get to do what they were supposed to do. But how do you preserve the highest level function for them as possible? That's the kind of information that's not available to healthcare providers. So when they come to the clinic, you never know that that's how they're figuring it out and whether they took it or why. So I mean, so I think our information, ability to know and understand routine, know and understand what people are up to, is really useful information that's missing now. 
People adjust their heart medications, for example, all, all the time. They'll adjust their diuretics because they have to go out to the shopping and they're really worried they're not going to find a bathroom. So they'll adjust their doses because they say, I can't afford to need to find a bathroom for the next four hours. Now, if they, on a regular basis, are doing that, and the physician thinks this is what they're supposed to be taking, gee, it's not working, so we up the dose, that's not the answer. The answer is they didn't take it those days, so how do we adjust around that? And that's the information that's missing, is how do we know those things that are between the lines about people and their health? So one of the things that we pride ourselves on at Citrus is to be very multidisciplinary. And so it occurs to me that in a situation like that, it might be considered an invasion of privacy to know the kind of information that you want to know. So you get lawyers involved, and you start thinking about privacy issues. Is that, does that ever come up in, in, in what, you're, what you're doing? Well, you know, it's in the context of research. Human subjects protections are in place. Um, and in, in clinical care, um, it's about having that, that trust relationship with the person and whether you mobilize an additional tool or not. That's something, you know, people have to know what you're doing. You can't sneak, sneak around and monitor them without them understanding it and what you're doing with the information and how you're protecting the information. So those kinds of issues have to be addressed. But even something as simple as actigraphy, I mean, to motivate people to get on with a routine of physical activity. And I'm, I'm really getting more and more interested in sedentary I mean, mon you know, sort of really monitoring the sedentary behavior because it's not really an opposite thing, active and sedentary. It's, you could just say when someone's not, not active, you know what sedentary is. I think it's really a big deal if someone sat in their barca lounger for five hours. Um, that probably is more of a predictor of health than whether they went for a one-mile run. <laughs> you know, so how do you, how do you tra track both of those things from an activity perspective and, and understand the meaning of them? Because it tells you what to do from an intervention perspective differently. That information is useful in a different way. Hello. Um, I like to... um, I like what you're saying about self-monitoring, um, and I was wondering how do you, I'm not convinced the right way, but convince patients to adopt the self-monitoring model without them feeling like they're a lab rat or like they're having some like, those types of privacy issues that you're mentioning and that kind of thing. Because I've definitely seen that work for me. Like you write things down. Well, I think part of it is being really transparent. You know, you have to, people have to see what it is and decide if they want to be part of it. Um, the example I gave earlier with the point of care around ordering the halibut was a really good example because that actually we would track over time what people chose and we could actually get information about their diet out of that. So that's, you know, it's a neat thing. Um, by being transparent and then having some early adopters who are willing to do it, and then also having them being willing to help their friends, pretty much. We didn't make it mandatory. People could do it if they wanted to. But it became the, the cool thing, you know, finding over the point. Of, we had to add extra monitors in the building because they were so motivated. It was so fun for them to do it. Their visitors would come, their family, and they'd want to see me order lunch, you know, they'd get on there. And it, so there's sort of a, you know, come a Tom Sawyer effect where you start to paint the fence and suddenly everyone wants to paint with you. So that you, I think you have to generate some buzz and some excitement around things like that. Um, the We Fit program, for example, is incredibly popular in nursing homes. It's not even, I mean, they, do, they do the bowling and that kind of thing on the We Fit. It's not really even that tailored to older people. I mean, there's a lot that could be done with We, I think, that could be much more tailored to the population. But getting the reinforcement where it's, there's that competitive thing where you, you actually can better your own scores or you can see how you are in relation to others. I mean, as long as you agree to be part of that, but that's part of it, the transparency. I think it's about making it very available and also translating to people how it's useful to them. What's the benefit? You know, why do they really want to do this? And um, we all respond to reinforcement in our lives. And so having some kind of a, something that comes back when you've put in, whether it's in the form of a little avatar that jumps around and gets really excited or some, you, know, you get a phone call from your primary care provider who goes, wow, I see that you've been logging on every day for the last three months and your data is fantastic. I'm, you know, your trends are looking good. Um, or even an email from a provider that says that. 
And I think you've got to figure out the rewards to get people to go. I'm not as concerned about how to get people to adopt um, because I do think that there, there are enough, and I've seen this with people in their 80s and 90s who are eager. You just have to make it accessible and not too confusing. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Yes. Uh, a question and a small uh, last idea about reminding patients to take medicine. Now, if I go to a pharmacy, if I pharmacist give me my medication, and if I give him my cell phone, and he can put a application, a small program, and every hour when it comes up, it will say, "Okay, it's time for you to take what." That just the pharmacist probably have to give me to be a pro, not programmer, have that thing programmed and just download it to my cell phone. That would do. Now I've, almost everybody has cell phone or things like that. Yeah. And the other thing about the privacy things, monitoring things, if we have a program instead of online connected to all the hospital, and it just say you keep it in your home, and when the uh, condition become dangerous or need to be cared, then the computer will pop out message to say something wrong, you better talk to your doctor. Then they can bring all the data to the doctors or things like that. And my find, I have a question is, nowadays uh, we are talking about all this, and do you have to work under the uh, supervision of medical doctor or nurse has some freedom to do things? Because I think if nurse has some freedom to do things, it will cut down medical costs a lot. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to be our spokesperson on that topic. Um, you know, it's, it's, that topic is coming up, and I don't know if you saw the article in USA Today last week with uh, 28 states where there's changes in the scope of practice for nursing um, being proposed, and there's a lot of pushback from the medical profession in some places. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I practice independently in Oregon and Washington, and what that means is you have the complete authority to manage care, primary care, you can prescribe you can prescribe home health. You can do all of that without any contact with a physician. That doesn't mean you don't work as a member of the team, because you do. You work with, with specialists of all kinds, and family practice doctors do that too. If they need to do neurosurgery, they sure as heck don't attempt it themselves. They could confer with a neurosurgeon. California is one of the most um, backward states in the nation. Um, on that issue. I was shocked when I came here to learn the scope of practice of nurse practitioners. Now, that's not to say that practice isn't happening in the ideal way, because if you were to drive to a rural community in the state, an underserved community, it is a nurse practitioner doing the care, and oftentimes there is no doctor in sight. So the practice is different from the law and the reimbursement, and that's, that has to change. And there's a, there's a national trend to, to move that, because when you think about 32 million new people needing care in this country, no matter how quickly we try to graduate people from medical school, we're not going to have enough people to meet the need. And I don't think it's an either-or situation. I think it's, the answer really is teams of people who can develop, deliver care in collaboration with each other, but not in a hierarchical way. So I would say that in some situations, a dietitian should be leading the team if the issues that someone's dealing with are very much dietary driven. Or it could be a pharmacist. If someone's on my average of the meds, of the people that I was caring for looking at it in the study, you know, 10 meds average is really high. And one of the people had 43. I would like to see the pharmacist leading that team to say how are we going to get these meds down. So I think the team approach is where we really need to head. And that's where I'm hoping with our school, as we start to develop new team approaches to care, where we can actually have those function in a very positive way that we'll start to change that, that assumption. But it's, it's changing. There's no doubt about it that it's changing. It's just quicker in some places than others. Yes? I didn't see a doctor. It was actually a nurse practitioner, uh, you know, uh, who took care of the whole problem, and, and uh, 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 so you know, she sent the X-rays or whatever to the doctor. But the, but the whole procedure was done by her, 
Uh, and the second comment I wanted to make is uh, I participated in um, this. I am diabetic, so you know I had uh, this one-on-one -on -one, uh, nurse uh, thing that you talked about, uh, a six-week program. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it uh, extremely useful, and uh, I think uh, it helped me a lot. And and you also learn from the you know group meeting from other people, and uh, mm -hmm. so. Uh, those are the two comments I want to make. Thank you very much for making those comments. I appreciate it. And I think we have time if there is one last question. There we go. How is the data that's collected from remote monitoring managed under HIPAA? Well, it depends on whether it's, um, if, it, if it's research collected data or whether it's clinical. And of course, clinical is what the HIPAA would be under the clinical data. It meets the same requirements that any kind of data would be that you know, you're collecting, whether it's imaging or a vital sign that you take in the hospital um, would need to go through the same kinds of consents. What's, what is your concern behind that? The, the privacy issue that people are concerned about is the, I'm sorry. The, the privacy issue that people are worried about um, as being a barrier to adoption is in a bit negated because of the HIPAA laws, because of the, they're, you're collecting medical data just at their home instead of in an ambulatory setting, and the data is then covered by the same protections, privacy protections, right? Yes, absolutely. Unless the, the material is being kept on their hard drive. Right, they're going to have to maintain their own security. And so, for right. example, with, uh, um, with Skype, for us doing our, our intervention, we actually are not using Skype because it's not a protected, secured connection. So we have a Skype equivalent that we're working with our, our Center for Health Technology on so that it's actually a secured connection so that our entire conversation is protected. Mm -hmm. So it's about making sure that's the case and then talking with people about how they secure their computers at home and passwords and that kind of thing. I think that's really important. It's one of the reasons many um, providers have been a little reluctant to use email with their patients unless it's within an electronic health record that has that protection around it. That's really an important point, and you know we just have to think about the information as belonging to the patient that they should have permission rights on it at all times, mm -hmm. and then the only people who see the data, those who have a reason to see it clinically, um, with the work that we're doing with the electronic health record where we're sharing data across sites, all of that's de-identified, mm -hmm. so that when you look at aggregates of big groups of people, you can actually draw some good conclusions, but you could never trace it back to an individual. It's really important. Thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you.